Then you see what we have. And the problem is that we have too many bacteria that start to get resistance towards these antibiotics. So we need new ones. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, we can do the following. We can improve existing antibiotics. We can do more structure activity relationship to find something that can boost activity. But as we discussed earlier on, the problem is we'll get an antibiotic to have a similar reaction mechanism to those that we already have, and the risk that we get resistance is very high. So maybe not ideal, but possible. We can take old drugs that may, maybe have been used for other things and see if they have antibacterial activity. That's quite common to do today. Or we can see, can we find some new chemicals that never been tested before? Could be from nature, or we can synthesize something and see what happens. Target based means that we know the reaction mechanism or how the target for our drug look like. So we can design something that will do the job exactly. High precision drugs, if you like. And this last one, rediscover old antibiotics. We can test things that has been testing in the past because we have better methods today and see, hmm, Maybe there will be an opportunity to develop these things into better drugs. I'm just going to show you a few examples. This stuff here, it looks like a very big molecule. It's a natural product. It's called vancomycin. It's also one of these super potent antibiotics. So if nothing else works, this is what we use. If you look here, this is basically the same structure, but in the red boxes, what I've shown is that we have modified the whole structure. To have two rings like this, it's just a lipophilic handle. It inhibits transpeptidases and cell wall biosynthesis in a more efficient way. If we change one of these carbonyls, and just remove the oxygen, we get something that has better activity. And if we have something like this, if you look careful now, I have a charge here, meaning that this compound will be very water soluble. Transportation is very efficient. But it also partly helps to induce cell membrane permeability. So this is an optimized version of vancomycin. We start with the old drug, we optimize it, get a better drug. This is a completely new one that was isolated from um, um, a microorganism. If you look careful on it, it looks like there is something that could reassemble a peptide, some amino acids, and a nucleoside, the building blocks we have in RNA and DNA. This have a unique activity discovered by serendipity but it's, it's pretty potent. And we'll think that this might be a new thing that we could bring on the market. And as far as I know, this is the last sort of thing that has been discovered that seems to be super potent. It's a peptide, a cyclic one, because you have a cyclic structure here. It inhibits cell wall synthesis. The mechanism for doing this is unique. It's not the same as the beta-lactams. And again, the reason why they discovered this was that somebody came up with a very smart way to grow microorganisms in the lab. Then they managed to grow enough of the microorganism and isolate this from this microorganism. And it turns out to be really, really potent. But if we just look quickly on this submerged island, one thing you can think of is, let's say that uh, all antibiotics suddenly stop working. We don't have anything like that. Is that a problem? Well, if you think a little bit about like, if you're a patient that needs a new kidney or a new liver or something like that, it will be almost impossible to have that kind of operations if you don't have antibiotics because we have to prevent the infections from doing the operation. 
It's one aspect. To move your appendix will probably be a major challenge. I mean, today we think about it, ah, it's nothing. It's a very quick operation. But if you don't have antibiotics to kill bacteria infection that might, you know, come into the wound, etc., probably quite a few people will die of that. I think it's like, you know, this would become a, a killer disease. I mean, today we say, nah, well, we just treat a little bit of antibiotics, no problem. But that will not be the case anymore if we don't have anything that works. Gonorrhea will become extremely difficult to treat. And uh, tuberculosis, as we mentioned earlier today, too, it's, it's the same. So a world without antibiotics is quite difficult to imagine. Things that we today take for granted will be a major health problem. So based on that, which I hope is a take home message, a part of this would be that we need to have new antibiotics. And these new antibiotics, they need to have novel mechanisms, not just copies of what we had in the past, but they have to really make a difference. Otherwise, we have no use for them, really. And if we say that this is important to develop, well, then we need medicinal chemists or scientists that can help developing this, testing this, so we can bring forward new antibiotics for treatment of all sorts of infectious diseases. And that's really a key thing. So usually since I'm teaching that subject, I would say that if you want to make a difference, it's not a bad thing to become a chemist because you can contribute to improving life of many people. Same with biology too. It's really a big, big challenge and it's completely underestimated the, the, the sort of scope of this and what we really have to do. Good, thanks. If, if I'm... If I'm going to be in my optimistic mood, I would say that uh, I think there are quite a few things that are in the pipeline that looks good. I think the, the last number I've seen, there is something in the order of 35 to 40 compounds in advanced clinical trials that are all what we call new antibiotics. That sounds good. The problem is that most of these are just reiterations of old drugs. We modify them a little bit. So probably it won't help in the long run. If I'm going to be more negative and think, uh, or maybe realistic would be a more a better word, I would say that, I wouldn't say we're screwed, but <laughs> pretty close to it. And, and th there, there might be many reasons for this. It's, it's not one simple answer to this. But one thing you can think of, the pharma industry that is supposed to provide the drugs it's mainly there to make cash. It's not run because it's important to, to bring improved health, but they have to earn money from it. And if you think a little bit about it, those antibiotics we have are absolutely awesome drugs. Because what you do, you get an infection, you go to the doctor, and the doctor say, take this for 10 days, and then you have solved the problem when the antibiotic is working, of course. 10 days. And if you think about that, okay, the pharma industry produced a drug, the patient takes it for 10 days, and that's it. But it's not much money to earn on that. If you think like, if another patient comes and say, you know, they have a disease, so you have to go on the drug for the rest of your life, then we're talking big money. So, one important thing has been that the pharma industry realized this many years ago that there is no real big money to earn in, in antibiotics. So we're not going to give that high priority. That's one issue. So yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it will be a challenge. So th then we have the other aspect that is quite interesting. So if you go back 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, that everybody was saying, you need to be a big company with you know, awesome lot of money in order to develop any drugs because it's a, a major effort and it costs absolutely ridiculous sums of money to do it. Just to illustrate that, to take one drug from the development all the way to the market, you talk about billions. 
and you know you need a massive workforce to do it and so on and so on. That has changed over the, the last 10 years because suddenly there are non-commercial companies that's running based on academic groups and so on. That's someone saying, ha, huh, we, we can do parts of this. We can, maybe we can't do the whole thing. And people like Bill Gates, who've been shuffling money into, for instance, anti-malaria projects and so on, really makes a huge difference. And suddenly you will see that there is a lot of academic groups that are involved in drug development, but they can't maybe do the whole lot. But it seems to be a completely different field today. And you also see it because the pharma industry today is much more keen on collaborating with academic groups. So from that perspective, I think it's, it looks much more healthy today. And there is also much more ideas about we shouldn't only do this for earning money. I mean, drug industry is... You know, you can really make a lot of money if you're involved in that. But suddenly people say, no, we need to do it because we have to take care of humanity. So it's changing attitude, changing how things uh, are working and how, how you organize things. I think there is good hope that some of these will successfully bring something to the market. I can tell you here in Sweden, there is an EU consortium. It's, it's run from Uppsala. Some years back, they got 700 millions to develop one new antibiotic. And as far as I know, they're, they're getting pretty close to getting something into the clinic that seems to be doing okay. And that's a joint sort of uh, investment from the EU and from some private companies and other sort of foundations. So sure, there is possibilities, but we probably need much more of it in order to speed up things.